Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming today. Uh, we're really blown away by how many people signed up to uh, attend this webinar. So we're super excited that there's so many people interested in learning more about our new digital data nuggets. This is set up as a webinar, so you don't have to worry that your mic is muted and your camera's off. We're recording the session and that's just for people who can't make it and to help reach more teachers. Um, there's a couple ways that you can participate with us. So you have already seen the chat and you're putting it in uh, where you're calling from and your name and doing a little introduction for yourself. Um, but you can also use uh, the Q&A feature, which you, you should see along the bottom. And this is a good way to ask any questions that you'd like answered. And um, you can also vote up and down each other's questions. So if there's something that a bunch of people want to know, that'll help us uh, know that that's something we should discuss. And then you can also, again, use the chat. You can use that to reach us, the moderators. So I'm Liz. We also have Aaron and Blake with us from Data Classroom. And so if you want to reach us, feel free to put that in the chat. Okay, so just to introduce myself, uh, my name is Liz Schulteis, and I'm the co-founder of Data Nuggets. Um, and I started as a scientist in plant biology. And then as a grad student, I caught the bug of working with teachers and got to go into a bunch of classrooms as a classroom scientist. And so I really enjoy you know, making resources that are useful for teachers and something that you know, you're gonna be able to use in your classroom. And then we also have with us um, Aaron, so. Can you introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. Sorry, I had an internet problem there, but I am very excited to uh, be here. Uh, I'm the, the co-founder of, of Data Classroom, and I've really enjoyed working with Liz and Data Nuggets over the last few years. Okay, so what are we going to talk about today? Here's a just a brief outline. Uh, first, I'm going to introduce what are Data Nuggets. Um, some of you might be familiar with Data Nuggets and Data Classroom, but we're still just gonna give background just in case. Then we're, I'm gonna talk about our new digital Data Nuggets on Data Classroom. And at the end of the webinar, we're gonna explore some authentic data sets. So we're gonna dig into an activity that you could use with your students right away. Uh, what are Data Nuggets? Uh, data Nuggets began, um, again, back about 10 years ago when I was a graduate student. And at this time I was going into classrooms, working as a classroom scientist with teachers. And this meant I was just helping teachers, you know, do research and inquiry with their students, sharing my work with, uh, with their classrooms. And all these teachers let us know that their students were really struggling when working with data and they needed some opportunities to practice working with, a, with authentic, uh, messy data sets. And this was really important because their students basically were feeling like they were doing something wrong when they would see uh, their own data sets. They would you know, conduct a classroom experiment, collect some data, um, and these data sets would be, have you know, missing values, would give them surprising results or uh, be kind of messy. And students had that feeling that they had messed up or they thought that all this variability was due to human error and not something representing something true and authentic about the study system that they're working in. So we thought, you know, as grad students or early career scientists, we could do something to uh, package our data and give this to teachers to use in the classroom. And basically today there are tons of these real world authentic data sets available, but they're not very easy to use, um, you know, straight off the bat. They're sometimes really hard to find, they're hard to curate and get ready to use in the classroom. It takes a ton of time to explore them. So one of the shared goals of Data Nuggets and Data Classroom is that we wanna work with scientists to help make as many data sets as possible accessible and easily used by teachers and by students. So this is an example of a data sheet from one of my uh, dissertation experiments here. So you can see what some messy data sets looks like. There's some plants that died during the experiment. There's tons of missing values. And these are the types of data sets that can be sort of tough for a student to get started with. And Liz, when, when, you're, when you're looking at, at data sets, just you know, as a professional who works with data, what are the kinds of sort of common messy factors that you expect to see in a data set that happen all the time? Yeah, we love to include this in data nuggets, but especially like missing values are super common. So something like a trial where the 
study organism died or escaped or something out of, out of a data set. So there's just like a blank row of data. Um, you also expect to see a ton of variability in a data set. So the reason you're taking multiple samples and doing your experiment in the first place is because not everything is the same and is going to give you the same exact value. And so you calculate an average, but there's tons of variability around that average. And that's sometimes really surprising for students. You know, you're looking for a signal often in the data. And so there's a signal. It could be the opposite of what you predicted when you set up your experiment or um, maybe there's no signal at all. So in data nuggets, we try to have a lot of data sets where the scientists set out to do something and it didn't work out that the way they thought that it would, because that's just something that happens all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's, uh, you know, I know, uh, I, and I was sort of playing devil's advocate because I just wanted to share that. But in my previous career as a high school teacher, I frequently had that sense that the the lab data my students were collecting was was somehow not good enough because of all those reasons that that you just said. And then when you get you know exposure to professional science, you realize, oh wait, it's always like that. That's just the nature of collecting data. Exactly. I'd say the only bigger contrast I've seen between a student collected data set and scientists data sets is just size. Sometimes a scientist just has like more time to go out and either work as a team or do an experiment over and over again to collect more data and students just don't have the you know time to collect a huge data set. But that's why it's a good compliment to use some student collected ones and some scientists collected data sets together so students can really see the full spectrum of what is out there. Absolutely. Data nuggets are free activities. They're all based on these authentic data sets. And the goal, again, is to highlight the messiness and complexity and really show what research and uh, data look like. They're all based on contemporary research. And this is because we've heard from teachers that students get really excited when they know that they're working with a data set that's from research that's happening today. It's something that um, scientists are doing work to answer questions that they don't know the answer to yet. So it's not just a canned lab where you might already know what the outcome is supposed to be. This is truly, you know, surprising results and um, research that's exploring the unknown right now. Each activity brings students to the entire process of science. So this means that it starts with the scientists coming up with their ideas, their questions, why they got interested in the study system that they're working in and then moves all the way to the end where students take on that role as a scientist and ask their own follow-up questions. So they saw a research study happen, they analyzed the data, and now they themselves are maybe inspired to go ask their own questions. And then each data nugget follows a familiar template. Um, this is to basically let students know they're doing a data nugget, they can forget about the structure of the activity and really focus on what makes a data set unique, a research question unique, and uh, basically focus on the science. So we have several goals for the Data Nugget project, and this we serve a bunch of different audiences. So for students, we want to engage them in science. We want to produce scientifically literate adults who know how to think with data, reason with data, um, and for teachers, we want to provide professional development. So this is to help you gain comfort using data in the classroom, comfort uh, talking about experimentation and um, basically anything that goes around using data sets in the classroom. And then for scientists, we have each data, each data nugget is written by the scientists behind the data set. And we think this is great because it's a way for scientists to serve as role models for students and to share their science story. But then it's also nice for scientists to practice that um, act of communicating their work to broad audiences. So I always joke that when I was a, a scientist first going into classrooms, the teachers I worked with would like be in the back of the classroom waving me off, telling me to stop talking because I had no idea how to talk to students and really simplify what I was saying. And so it's, a, it's just great practice for scientists to have to do that as well. So this is what our website looks like. Um, we have about 100 data nugget activities up right now. And so we're slowly converting all the paper data nuggets that you might be more familiar with into digital forms. And so far, I think we have about 20 of the 100 converted over into digital activities. But if you ever see one that's not, just let us know and we'll prioritize that one to come up next. 
And so here's a, this is what our table of data nuggets looks like. So you can search by um, keywords and look at the pictures and just find any topic that you're interested in. Uh, my background is again, plant biology and ecology. And so we had a lot of, we have a lot of ecology and evolution themed activities, but we're slowly trying to add physics and chemistry and all different topics. Cause we know that um, not just biology teachers want to use data in the classroom. Uh, we recently completed a research study on data nuggets. So we were hearing from teachers that it looked like students using data nuggets were getting something out of them compared to the typical instruction that they had in classrooms. But we wanted to collect data to see really what those effects were. So we found that students who use data nuggets compared to typical classroom instruction spent more time doing science. So this is engaged in the science practices. So things like asking questions, reading scientific texts, working with data. So if you're looking to you know, use more science practices in your classroom, this is a, a great way to do it. Students also improved in their ability to construct explanations. So this is their ability to answer a scientific question, make a claim, and then back that claim up with data as evidence. They also had increased confidence with, uh, when working with data and increased motivation to pursue STEM careers. So this, you know, if you're using a data nugget in the classroom, we always include a lot of information about the scientists and who they are. And so it's a great way to show your students what a science career looks like. Uh, Liz, there's an interesting question that just came in about, is there, is there a data nugget based on that study? That is, that's the dream. <laughs> It'd be wrong to say that was the entire reason we did that research, but that would be, that's what we definitely want to do. So we just submitted that paper. It's not, basically that's hot off the presses. We just finished analyzing our own data. And so you'll, you'll plan to move to a data nugget once that's accepted for publication somewhere. Exactly, yeah. The da yeah, data on data nuggets, data nugget is coming up. <laughs> Very meta. Yeah. Okay, so that's the background on data nuggets. And basically we, uh, those activities were inspired by requests from teachers. And now the requests we're hearing are all, okay, my students you know, like working with data, but they need the opportunity to work with larger data sets. So at the end of a data nugget, students are kind of left without any op or you know any mechanism to really like ask their own question, get a big data set to dig into. And so our motivation was to find a good partner to, to uh, help us uh, help students explore these larger data sets. So we worked with a ton of the other platforms out there and playing around with all of them, we found Data Classroom to be our favorite. It has all the features that we want students to be able to explore like doing statistics and um, really exploring variability in data sets. And so I'm gonna walk you through uh, what Data Classroom looks like right now. So this is just a list of all the opportunities that we were thinking about that we wanna give students um, the ability to do. So first we need something that allows students to really grapple with the messiness in a data set. So they have to be able to see variability, they have to be able to see the missing values, explore outliers, other um, you know, qualities of the data that way. It's nice if we can provide students with extra variables. And so this is a challenge we've heard from teachers where students sometimes are just drawn to graph any data you give them without really critically thinking about what is in this data set that's important to answer the question I'm going after. So if we can give them more data than they need, that gives them the, you know, the, the challenge of digging into it and really thinking about what they uh, want to graph and, and want to think about. Um, we obviously, we had to turn to technology to visualize larger data sets because even a couple of the paper activities are a little tedious for students to graph by hand. Um, and then this also gives students the chance to sort of play with data formatting and, and uh, struggle with the structure of data. So it gets them, it starts to introduce a whole new skill set of how do I work with data online? I can't just have this messy, you know, data sheet that I've scribbled. I have to format it in a way that computers can deal with. And Liz, if we could just pause here, just a couple of questions I was seeing about 
um, you know, what what is the difference between data nuggets and data classroom? And I just want to interject that data classroom is a, is a separate entity that partners with with data nuggets. And data classroom is a web application for working with data on on any device that has uh, an internet connection. Although I do not recommend it on phones, as the the <laughs> screen is going to be too small to really get it to work. Um, but so it is it is a tool. And it pairs very well with with some of the the data nuggets. And then this other question, I'm gonna I'm gonna give to you, although I already know the answer. Uh, with with these the creation of these new digital data nuggets, are the paper data nuggets going away? Oh, definitely not. <laughs> and that that's actually kind of something that Aaron and I are looking into for the future. We want to see how paper and digital activities pair with each other. And we're not suggesting you completely drop paper and go all digital or, you know, do all paper and don't do digital, that there's basically, you know, some learning experiences that students are going to get from each of those um, platforms that they might not get from the other. So like it's scientists still, you know, scribble a graph on a piece of paper to mock up what their you know visualization should look like. It's really nice to like, to challenge students to think about how to construct a graph by hand before you jump into a platform that does a lot of those steps for them. But I'll try to talk about all the ways they kind of, they complement each other where, um, you know, the paper activity maybe makes students think more critically about all their decisions where the digital platform lets them explore data more fluidly without being locked into like the first graph that they decided to make. So they definitely, they pair really nicely. So I'll show you from the Data Nugget website, you can get to the digital activities on Data Classroom and then the Data Classroom website, you can find all the Data Nuggets as well. So there's whichever platform you're more comfortable with, you can find them both ways. Okay, um, so again, digital Data Nuggets are this way to give students an opportunity to explore larger data sets more than what's possible in a pen and paper activity. Uh, the platform makes it super easy to graph and play with data. And so again, you know, students aren't drawing individual data points on a graph. So they're more likely to click through a bunch of different representations and, and see what graph actually best uh, fits the data. And they can explore multiple variables as they're trying to decide what's the appropriate graph to make. So we've done a little piloting of digital data nuggets um, in the classroom. And so we got some really good feedback from students. They told us that it made them feel more like they were being treated as an adult. So they kind of had the hunch or they know that scientists aren't sitting drawing little graphs with every single data point on a piece of paper. So they feel it's another way to really have help them feel like they're doing the work of scientists and, you know, and they are scientists themselves. It's less tedious, obviously. Liz, um, what is if I could just it, just interrupt for a second, what is the range of 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 age range that uh, you have data nuggets available for? Oh yeah, so that's that's a good question. This piloting was all done in high school classrooms, but we have data nuggets that range from working in an elementary classroom, maybe fourth grade, I'd say, is the youngest that we've seen it them work in, um, up to like undergraduate adult level. So they're all all uh, different levels. And I can show you on our website how to find the one that will fit your students the best. That's a good question. Um, students also, oh, I uh, didn't mention yet. Um, students can customize how their graphs look uh, really easily in data classroom, which kind of gets a little extra buy-in, especially from students who like to make a pretty graph and you know really customize and take ownership of something. So that's you know potential beyond what they can do pen and paper. And then also we see much longer explanations from students and a lot more uh, you know, typing and longer discussions about what they're seeing in the data set when they can type and don't have to handwrite out responses. So you might get a little more out of your students about what they're thinking if, uh, if they're typing their responses. Okay, so before we move on, is, are there any questions right now? I think we're good. Okay, good. You, oh, Blake, do you have any? 
Uh, one question from the chat that I'd actually like to hear an answer to is, are those sweet data classroom stickers available for sale somewhere? Is, and is there any other data nuggets or data classroom merch available? That's awesome. Uh, well, yes, uh, we will just send those to you for free if you want one. So just send us an email. And I'm guessing Data Nuggets also has some free stickers to send out if uh, they email Liz. Exactly. Yeah, we have we have a couple stickers. Every once in a while, we'll make some like little bonus swag. But right now, stickers for sure. If you send us your address, we'll definitely send you something. Uh, and then I have a couple other questions if we still have time. One was, uh, do you plan to include any videos of experiments carried out by the scientists? That's awesome question. Yeah, we, we, um, with any data nugget, if a scientist gives us extra material, we'll always post that on the website. So if you go to the bottom of a page for a data nugget, there's lists of like blog posts that the scientist has written or um, photo galleries that you can show to your students. And we don't have that many videos yet. Mostly, I think just because people aren't that comfortable making videos, but maybe now with everyone being more comfortable doing digital stuff there, we could uh, get more scientists doing that. We have a couple. So if you're interested in an activity that has a video of the scientists, just message us and ask, and I can give you a couple suggestions of ones that do, but that's something we'd love to add. And if anyone is uh, tech savvy or good at shooting video, that would be a really cool like student project to interview a scientist and create a video. So, you know, if your students get inspired and motivated to make resources, we'll always share them out with other people. So basically, you know, we make the resources, but we also want to be a repository to share with each other all the, the cool stuff you're making. I've got a couple other questions coming in too. Uh, are there any data nuggets available in other languages? Yeah, and actually the one that we are going to show you today is translated into Spanish. So right now we only have Spanish translations and um, that's mostly because I am monolingual. <laughs> and so we've been taking, you know, anybody who wants to volunteer and translate something for us, we'd love to put that up on the website. And so all the ones that we have right now are um, basically peer reviewed. So you can kind of, you can trust the translation. We have somebody do it, either the scientist who wrote the data nugget or, you know, somebody who speaks another language, and then we'll have somebody else peer review that translation. Um, again, if students wanted to do that as like a language assignment, that would be really cool. We'd love to share that. Liz, can when we put up this this data set um, the, as a digital data nugget, can we also put up a Spanish version? Yeah. Yeah. All right, cool. yeah let's do that. Okay, so now we kind of mentioned the data nuggets, so I'll just I'll get into this one. The one we're doing is um, springing forward. So this is, oh, here you go. So here's what this looks like on our website. We have level one, which this is a, a new version that we've added that a teacher made for us. So it started, this is the first version we had, level three, which is more like high school, um, maybe even like AP level, the language is a little difficult. Um, it just basically, we had a hard time translating it down into like a really easy reading level. But then a teacher, an elementary teacher said, I wanna use this with my students. So he rewrote it for us and made it accessible for his kids. So we shared that version online now here too. And then here's the Spanish translation. So this is a really special one because we have it in all these different reading formats. And we have the paper and digital data sets. So you really can customize this completely for your classroom. You know, you can make it a really easy reading level and a really challenging data experience, which is nice because if students aren't struggling with the content, they can really think about the data. This data nugget is all about climate change. And the question is about how plants respond to climate change. And so basically, you know, temperatures are getting warmer, precipitation is changing. How is it that plants are gonna deal with these changes and what are the changes that we can see in, in plants in response? So one way that plants respond is through shifts in phenology. And basically in a data nugget, we like to only really introduce like one or two kind of science terms so that students don't have to struggle with too much language. But this one, you know, will define phenology, which is the timing of all plant life cycle events. So this is things like a seed germinating or making leaves or producing flowers or fruits. And 
a lot of these uh, qualities of plants respond to the environment. So if it's, you know, right now we're in springtime. And so, you know, plants are starting to, you know, wake up in the spring and the temperature right now is what's driving a lot of these shifts for plants. So what's gonna happen as temperatures get warmer, plants gonna change in response. Phenology is a really important thing to measure because it has, it affects all the interactions that plants have with other species. So for example, if a plant relies on a pollinator to produce seeds, there's a chance that if it's flowering earlier, it's gonna get mismatched from its pollinator and maybe won't be able to make seeds and leave behind offspring. So if some plants are responding and some plants aren't, this could harm you know, a pollinator population or it could harm the plants. So it's, a, it's, a pretty, it's pretty important if plants are shifting. It's also really important for plant competition. And this is basically, you know, if you're a species that can take advantage of the fact that spring is warming up earlier and you can either leaf out and shade out your competitors or germinate first and outcompete the plants next to you, this is gonna give you a, you know, a boost over the other species in the area. There's many other reasons that phenology matters, but those are some of the, some of the key ones. So, how do scientists study phenology? Um, you can do really long-term measurements. So you could study the same species in one area for 50 years and see that you know, year after many years, the plant is maybe making its flowers a little bit earlier. But you can also do an experiment where you simulate climate change in the future. So this is an experiment at the Kellogg Biological Station um, in Michigan. And these are heating rings that simulate the future climate change for Michigan. So we have normal rings that are just air temperature and then heated rings that are three degrees warmer, which is I think the prediction a hundred years in the future for Michigan. These rings are, uh, there's eight of them. There's four heated, four um, control and they're randomized in this field. So they're not in any particular order because you could talk to students about experimental design here where if all the heated ones were in this corner, potentially it's wetter, potentially herbivores are over here. You know, you don't know what's different about different parts of this field. So you put them randomly mixed in with each other. So um, you're controlling all the other environmental things that could be different between plots. And Liz, what was the full scale of this experiment? How, how many of these plots did you have? So it is, it's just these ones that you can see here. So there's eight total, four, and then in each of these rings are a bunch of plants that we planted in. So there's actually thousands of plants that we were studying, but just because these rings are pretty expensive to build that there's not that many of them. And you're, you're recording data on the individual plant level. So each observation is, is specific plants. Exactly, yeah. So we'd go into each of these rings. Um, here, I have some pictures. These are the scientists taking some measurements. We try not to walk in the rings too much because you don't want to like step on the experimental plants, but a lot of what you observe, you can observe from right outside. Um, so, you know, even from these photos, you can see some flowers. So we would go to each individual study plant and measure the date that it produced a flower and go out day after day, check every plant every time and, uh, and see when it was flowering out. Here's some scientists looking at plants a little more closely. We have a lot of undergrads who come and work at KBS. So your students can see scientists who are not that much older than them collecting data and show that you know, this is work that they themselves could be engaged in. Okay, so the data set that's in the paper data nugget is focused on one species from that whole experiment. So I think the experiment has um, I want to say 30 species, maybe more. Um, and so this, we just pulled out the data from Dame's Rocket, um, an exotic plant in Michigan, and we focused on that in the data nugget. This is what the paper data set looks like. It's super simple. And it's just basically how many plants survived, um, the day where their first flower appeared, and how many, um, then converting this date into a number where basically uh, this is 
uh, basically 16 days after the start of the experiment was when the first flower appeared. That's because dates are kind of hard to graph and do statistics with. So you convert it into this um, even number and put it all on some the same scale. And then we have data for the normal rings that are just control ambient temperature and then the heated rings that are uh, three degrees warmer. Liz, on the, on the topic of the rings, why was the triangle shape chosen? Oh, interesting. I'm gonna guess that it was because it was probably the easiest to build that it, maybe getting like round metal, um, you know, making a ring would have been more difficult. Um, there's definitely calculations for, here, I'll go back to a picture so you can see. This is how the heating is done. There's these heaters spaced along the metal bars. And I know we took heat measurements from all different parts of this plot to make sure the whole plot was kind of getting the same temperature. So it was probably a balance of cost and making sure, you know, plants aren't getting totally different treatments at different parts of the plot. Um, and then what's kind of cool too is these heaters are also on the control plots. So maybe their presence is doing something like the shininess is scaring away an herbivore or you know, changing something about the experiment. So even the control rings have the heaters on them, they're just not turned on. But actually, yeah, so these rings were built right before I got there. So I, didn't, I wasn't part of the planning on like how to construct them. That's a good question. And this is what the uh, graph looks like in the data nugget. Your students will take these data and show that basically in the heated rings, plants flowered about 10 days earlier than in the normal rings. So they shifted their phenology in response to the warming, made their flowers earlier in the year. So that's a nice simple data set. It's a great you know, introduction to help students just practice basic graphing skills. But what if your students wanna really get into the data set, ask their own questions, explore a larger data set. And so now we're gonna go into data classroom and see what this can look like. Aaron, do you have a question? No, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna hold off. <laughs> okay, so here is the springing forward data set. This is similar to what's in the paper data nugget, but there's just a lot more here. So we have the ring number, so one through eight, the treatment that the ring received. So whether the temperature was elevated or ambient. So those are kind of jargony words. What's really nice is in this um, program, you can change the terms if you don't like them or if they're too complicated for your students. So in this case, elevated, we could change to heated and ambient, we can change to control. And so now in our graph, um, it's not gonna use these you know, technical terms in the future, which is really nice. Okay, so we have plant number. This is, there's a, you know, a bunch of this species in each ring. So we have replication in each ring. We have whether the plant survived or not, whether it flowered, the calendar day that it made its first flower. And then this is that date converted into a number. So this plant made its first flower five days after we started the experiment. Um, and you can see there are missing values like we talked about that you know some cells are missing because this, this plant didn't survive. Um, and you can exclude the dead ones from your analysis if you want to, or the program works just fine if you leave some of those missing values in. And Liz, can you do you want to just uh, uh, quickly scroll through that to show them like the the extent of the data here? Oh, smart, yeah. So here we can scroll down. We see ring one, ring two, ring three, ring four, ring five, six, seven, eight. So this again is just one species, this Dames Rocket plant, and so you can tell that there are seventy individuals of this species in the experiment. This in in um, this is something I know from working with my own students and also from working with a lot of teachers in the last year. This this is tidy format and this is not necessarily the first go to that people will have when formatting data where each row represents an individual thing that you observed or measured. But, but that is the the foundation of this tidy data. And if you if you teach your students to work in this format, this is going to benefit them when they go to college or to their job because this is quickly becoming 
the standard for for business and, and science alike. It's been the standard for science for quite some time, but now business is is finally catching on as they're starting to do more and more things with data. Yeah, it's a really valuable skill, and if you're doing something pen and paper, you can kind of get away with ignoring it. You know, you can record your data any way you want, and the gra- and make a graph. You might have just made your own job a little more difficult, but it still works. So I I like that the computer program kind of forces you. If you if you're not getting the kind of graph you expect, you have to go back to your data table and say, what should I change about the way I have this data recorded, to, you know, to get to that place where I, I'm getting a graph that I'm looking for. And and for big data sets, so this is something I'll just stress for the audience. It really gives you the ability to let the computer do the hard work. And so like. If you want days of first flower and you want to know what the average value is for that, or you want to know what the average value is for elevated versus uh, the ambient or the control, the, the, you can just ask the computer, give me the average of day of first flower and split that up by a certain category. And it's, you know, you can calculate that by hand when you have small data sets, but when you have 70 rows, 100 rows, or 10,000 rows of data, that's not the thing you want to be doing by hand. And this format allows the computer to do the heavy lifting for you. Yeah. Even in paper data nuggets, we'll suggest to teachers to like jigsaw the activity. If there's too much data, break your students into groups and have them each graph or average a subset. So it's nice. This makes that not necessary where students can actually do the whole data set and not have to break it apart. Okay. So here are the two different views when you're working with the data. We started in our table view, and now we can go over to the graphing view and we can start to explore. So the data sets that were, or the variables that we're interested in to answer our question about whether the treatments shifted when plants flowered or the phenology of plants is this treatment, whether it was heated or the control, and the day that the plant made its first flower. So you just hit show to put those as options to graph. Um, And again, this is a great chance where students have to look at all these choices and say, what are the appropriate variables to answer the question I'm after? So the first view we can make here is a histogram. And this shows the number of observations in different categories. So here we have the heated rings and the control rings, and we can see there's about an even number of plants in each of the treatments. And it's kind of interesting because they started the same. So maybe a couple extra plants died in the uh, heated condition. You can tell maybe that would be like a slightly harsher environment for plants. So not too many died in the experiment, but you can sort of see that effect there. We can also look at the day, the distribution of the data for when plants first made a flower. So this is how many plants made flowers on different days. So there was kind of a peak here where plants made flowers around five days, and then another peak where they made it around day 17. And we can break this apart now by treatment. So this is how we use this Z variable, which color codes based on a category. So now we can see that the plants in the heated treatment were all this um, hump in the data, and then all the plants in the control treatment were this hump. So you can see the treatments totally pulled these plants apart where all the heated ones are making their flowers earlier than all the control plants. So I like to start when I'm exploring a data set, I like to start with a histogram because it makes students really think about what's in this data set I'm looking at. You can do that in the table view where we just, you know, scrolled through and looked at everything, but it's really nice in the graph view to get a sense of, you know, what, what's in this big spreadsheet that I'm looking at. So now we can move from this histogram graph into um, making bar charts and scatter plots. And here we think about what we want to put on our X and Y axis. So we want to put the treatment of heated or control on the X and then the day that the plant made its first flower on the Y. Um, I get, so I was playing with this data set before we started and I forgot to uncheck everything. So you can see there's already some statistics on this graph, but you just click this uh, box here and it uh, pops up, like Aaron said, the computer does the work where it calculated the, the mean for you and the and um, you can see the difference between the heated and the control plots right super easily. So you basically get the numbers back that you would have had on the paper activity. And Liz, for, for a teacher who might not be used to seeing this kind of a graph, like they might be used to seeing more what was on that paper data nugget where 
It was just a bar and the height of the bar was, was the average. What are the advantages of seeing this kind of a graph? That's true. Yeah, I really like that this is the first thing that pops up for students. This is every data point is now represented on the graph. So instead of collapsing a, a bunch of observations down into one number, the average and graphing that average, this is showing you the spread of the data as well. So you can you know, see that the mean is falling somewhere here around five, but now students are also seeing this full range of not every plant flowered on that same day. You know, it wasn't that in the heated plots, everybody acted the same. So this is that nice quality about exploring variability we talked about earlier, where students see there's complexity in a data set. It's, and if they get this much variability, it's not a mistake that they made. It's just truly what happens in nature. Not every plant, you know, flowers on the same day. And can you go over what, what are those bars above and below the little dot that's showing the mean? What are those, what are those showing us? So here you can see there's different choices about what these bars represent. So right now we've selected mean with a standard deviation. So this is the average is the point and then the whiskers are um, capturing, they're a measure of the spread in the data. So um, basically the longer or the wider these bars are, the more variable the data are. And that's another interesting question students can look at like in the heated, uh, plots, there looks like there's more variability than in the control. So that's not only is, you know, thinking about if the average has shifted, not only is that interesting, but it's also interesting to think about if you're creating more variability. So maybe, you know, climate change is going to pull plants apart in the way that they're responding. So like they might respond to heating in, in um, less predictable ways, which is kind of an, another interesting question students can think about. Um, and you can also change what these uh, bars show. So you can do a standard deviation, you can do a standard error, and uh, confidence intervals as well. You can switch also to a box and whisker plot. So this shows the median or the most common value right in the data set. And then this, um, these whiskers capture the full spread of the data. So this is again, another good way to look at the variability in a data set. Um, and then the other nice feature, one of the reasons we really like Data Classroom is that it lets you do some hypothesis testing to actually answer your scientific question. So in a data nugget on paper, students would draw these graphs and they'd see that they were different, but you wouldn't actually know statistically if they're different. So if you want to get into statistics with your students, you can run a hypothesis test here. And the way this program deals with statistics is it lets the graph guide what the correct test is. So because this was a graph where we put two categorical values on our x-axis, it's telling us that a t-test is the appropriate test to run. So all you have to do is hit calculate and it will give you the, the p-value, which helps answer that question of, are these two values different from each other? So we got a p-value of less than 0.01, meaning that we have you know, good confidence that these groups are different from each other. And p-values are kind of a tough concept. So I definitely recommend having your students click this explain button here. And it gives a full explanation of how to interpret the p-value where it's not this absolute yes or no answer, it's a measure of confidence that we have in whether the groups are different. And so the way we raise our confidence is doing is having more replication, more plants in our experiment. And uh, basically this is showing us that we've done a sufficiently sized experiment, we can really answer our question. And this little slider is kind of fun. Students can explore what different p-values mean. So we had our value all the way down here, but what if we had gotten a point value of a p value of 0.8? That would mean we had no evidence that the groups were different from each other. And then if you slide around, you can get an idea of how to interpret different values. So anyway, something if you want to go into statistics, it's another, it's a fun thing to play with. Okay, so this is a again just the one. Um, species in this data set. 
So there's actually a ton of other data that have been collected using those heating rings. And we're gonna make these data sets available to all of you who've signed up for the webinar, or you could always email me in the future if you would like the data sets. I think you know you as teachers should be confident in emailing a scientist. Like if you think someone's work is cool and you want your students to work with their data, send them an email. They'd be super complimented and you know probably really excited to share their data sets with you. So always reach out if you you know want something to use with students. So now this was a data set that was already in Data Classroom as a digital data nugget, but I'm going to show you what it looks like to bring in a data set from outside that you find from somewhere else. So here is basically the landing page that you get when you make an account in Data Classroom. And there's this button here that says import and you can bring in data from outside the program. And there's a bunch of different ways to do that. You can link it to a spreadsheet in Google Drive. You can upload a spreadsheet. And this is the way that I keep using is you can just copy and paste cells in from, uh, from something that you already have on your computer. So here, these are all, I open these in advance, all the data sets I have related to this data nugget. So this data set are the temperature, uh, is the temperature measurements from in the rings. So your students might wonder, did the rings work? You know, were the rings that were supposed to be warmer actually warmer than the control? So we could just copy this data, go back to the program and paste it in here and it automatically pops up in the program, which is super nice and much easier than importing data in anything else I've worked with before. Uh, there's a couple steps when you bring in your own data set that you have to do that you didn't have to do in the other activity. You have to just tell the program which, um, what type of data each of these variables are. So this is good practice for students. So what is date? It's kind of, this is a tough one. I actually, I'm just gonna call this one info because it's really not something we're gonna end up graphing. We're gonna- yeah, well, That's right. When it's something that you can't graph or analyze statistically, info is the best choice. Good, yeah, just basically tell the computer we're not that interested in graphing this one. Um, here's that same date converted into that same number or like which numeric day of the year is it? And this number is a little different than the other data set. This one is, the day of the year, like so January 1st is number one. And so 60 is, uh, you know, later, <laughs> later in the year. So it's a little different than calculated from the start of the experiment, like the other data set. So that's something, you know, students have to kind of grapple when they're bringing data in from other sources. So here we go, here's, an, this one's a number. The treatment is a category. So it's whether the plants were growing in ambient or um, he heated or elevated. And then here's the um, air temperature. So this is the individual measurement that was made. That one's numeric. All right, we'll go over to graph. And so now our question is whether the treatments were successful. So we want to know, um, we want to plot our treatment, we want to plot our air temperature, and then we can also plot these two things over time and see what the pattern looks like over time. So um, let's see, this is just basically telling us that we have equal observations in both uh, treatments. But let's go over to this graph. We'll put time on our X and the temperature on our Y. So we can see over time, this is, you know, going from like January on that the temperature is going up. And then we can use the Z variable to color code by the different treatments. And now we can add a regression line and add a different regression line for each of these two treatments. So you can tell that steadily the um, elevated rings were slightly warmer than the ambient ring. So it looks like the treatments worked. And students can play around. This is like, you know, this ended up being a little difficult to see. You can go over to this appearance tab and change some qualities of the data. So maybe the, these points are a little big to see the regression lines, so you can shrink them down. Um, you could pick different colors. So in this case, let's see, we'll go and choose, 
for ambient that's oops, sorry ambient that's kind of of a cool color and then elevated we can pick a, a warmer looking color so now you know if students want to get really into customizing the look of the graphs they can use color to help the graph tell the story better so now someone looking at this graph is going to see the colors and sort of understand cool and warm uh, a lot easier and then this is fun i haven't i haven't thought about what we should use for this data set but you can also go into uh, data emojis, which is super fun because it turns all the data points into an emoji, but you can choose an emoji that makes sense for your data set. So what if we, actually, I'm going to do that, an individual one for each treatment, but let's see, ambient is cold, so let's type in cold and see what happens. There we go. We'll do cold spaces for the cold data and then for the warm data, let's type in warm. Or hot. There you go, hot face. So just it's just a little fun, but now you can see each data point. It's a little more intuitive when students are looking at the graph. So it's again, if students are not super excited about the data aspect, but are really visual and like to create something artistic, it's fun that they can play around. Okay, and actually, I had a third data set, but we're running out of time, so I don't want to. I won't even go into that one. This one's pretty timely. Uh, can you import or upload your graphs once you've made them into somewhere else? This person was asking about the Canvas LMS, but I think this answer will go for anywhere. Yeah, it's su super easy. So especially, yeah, if you're doing a data nugget, maybe students have the word copy of the data nugget, but you want them to type their answers out and give you back their graphs that way. Anywhere you see this camera, you can copy the image so you can, copy as many graphs as you want out of the program. So all you do is hit the camera, hit copy. And then for example, I'll go back to my PowerPoint. We could just really easily paste the graph in that we just made into, into a PowerPoint, into a Word document, everywhere you paste it, it pastes over really nicely. So that's a, a great way for students, especially if they're making a couple different variations of their graphs to, you know, see them side by side. I like pasting graphs into PowerPoints because you can quickly toggle through all the different ones you made and, uh, you know, see which ones you like. So again, okay, so I won't go into this, but if you want this data set, we also have, uh, how many rows is this one? Over a thousand. So these are all the plants in the experiment all the different species of plants that we that we included, a lot of other information about them. So whether they're a native plant that is uh, naturally occurring in Michigan, or whether it's invasive or an introduced plant that's from somewhere else. And so there, um, there's a cool question you can ask with this data set too about whether invasive species are going to get a boost from climate change. So if invasives are more able to shift their phenology and flower earlier, they might become better at outcompeting native plants even to a greater degree in the future under climate change. So if you know you're you have the buy-in on the topic of climate change, if students are really interested in invasive species, that's another you know exciting question you can ask. Um, there's also tons of different types of plants in the experiment. So asters are like sunflower type species, there's pea plant species. So you can kind of come at this data set from all different perspectives. Maybe each student chooses their own species to graph and then the class has a dialogue about, um, you know, did all the species show the same pattern? Did some species show totally different patterns? That's another really good question to ask. But anyway, so if you need inspiration of how to use the data, let me know. I was gonna say, I don't know how hard our deadline is to stop, but if some of our um, participants had questions for you specifically about that data set, would you entertain those questions via email? Yeah, definitely. Here, did I put, okay, here, I'll just put this uh, slide up so you can see it right now, but um, you could find us either Data Nuggets or Data Classroom on social media, and then here's my email address. I'll make that full screen right now. Um, feel free to email me or Aaron and we'll, you know, get back to you about any questions you have about any of the, the data sets on there. If you have a topic you're interested in, we'd love to help you find 
a, the right data set to fit. So again, I know invasive plants really well. Aaron knows lizards really well, uh, but we all, we know other scientists. So if you, any topic you're thinking of, just let us know and we'll uh, help hunt down some data for you. And then Liz, before we do go, and I, and I can stick around and answer your questions too, if that's, if that's helpful for people, but um, what, do you want to show people exactly where they can find the digital data nuggets on data classroom um, if they're, if they're looking for those? Yes. Okay. Good idea. Okay. So from the data classroom website, um, a good way to, oh, here, yeah, we can just do it here. So from this uh, graphing page, you just go to browse and then under resource library, are all the ready to teach and other activities that are on Data Classroom. And to specifically find data nuggets, just type in data nugget and we'll bring up our data sets. So now you can see all the different topics here. So if you're looking one, for one for AP biology that focuses on ecology or climate change, you can search by all these terms and keep narrowing down what you're looking for. So here's all the ones um, so far. I can also show you from our data nugget website, we have all of the data nuggets here in a table, but we now on this math and science concepts table, we've put whether or not there's a digital one available. So if you just type in the word digital, it'll condense this table down just to the ones that are available as digital data nuggets. And you can uh, you know, follow links on our page to get there. So whether you wanna navigate you know, you find one on Data Classroom and you want to navigate to the rest of them or you're starting on our site, you can find them either way. And again, just shoot us an email or send us a message if there's something that you're looking for that you can't find. Okay, so we're right at nine. So I'll say thank you for everybody who came. Uh, we're, again, really excited about the response that we got to this and that so many people were interested in learning more about digital data nuggets. Um, and then we can just, yeah, hang out and answer more questions as they come in, but also we're at the end. So if you feel like you wanna go enjoy your evening. So thanks for coming everybody. Thanks everyone. Okay, Blake, do we have other? We questions? do, I'll, I'll just go some of the questions that were unanswered. Um, Chuck McWilliams uh, asked, uh, as a result of his work with a lot of other scientists at local universities, how could he get them involved? So for scientists that we're trying to, you know, get excited about doing a data nugget, uh, we basically say that like by sharing your research, you're improving or you're expanding the reach of your work. So this is a good way to practice to, like, identifying the story in your research. Um, if you make something that works for a student, it's probably gonna be a lot easier to also explain it to another scientist outside of your field, what you do. Um, and both Data Nuggets and Data Classroom get a ton of users. So it's a nice also way for a scientist to make something and get a big reach from their work. So you're not gonna make something that you know, doesn't actually end up in a classroom, that teachers are actively using these resources and it's just, it's a low, low input, high reward uh, activity to do. Um, I can show you, so on our Data Nugget website, if you want to learn more about the scientists behind the work, we also have this meet the scientists table. And so again, one of the big impacts of Data Nuggets is the fact that scientists are serving as role models for students and students are seeing what scientists look like, who are the, the people behind this work. So even just like scrolling through this table is really nice. You get to see like the diversity of scientists and um, all the people behind the work. And then you can click someone's name and get taken to their professional website where maybe they have videos about their research. Um, you, know, you can learn a lot more about each person by clicking their name on this table. Uh, one, one had a question, uh, one person had a question about, they saying they work with local scientists at, at different universities. Uh, is there a way they can help get them involved? Yeah, it, so if someone wants to make a data nugget, um, there's all this information we have on our website for getting started. 
So whether you want to make a digital version of it or a paper one, it's nice to just start here and then we'll hone the story, identify what the right data is to share. So if you want to just share this link with them, this might be a good way to, to just get them the materials they need. You can download, we have a template that makes it really easy to get started. We've tried to include all the information that somebody would need to write one. And so you don't have to, you know, think from scratch, like, what do I want to include in each paragraph of this activity? We say, you know, this is what should be in paragraph one, two, three, send us some pictures, send us your data. We've tried to make it as painless as possible. But yeah, just go explore under this making a data nugget tab. And then we have a lot of, just a lot of resources under there for people. Um, and I think, you know, for Aaron, for Data Classroom, I think even if you didn't want to make a full activity, but you just wanted to get your data set out there, you could put it up on Data Classroom, allow, you know, set it so that teachers can use it and you don't have to go through the whole like journey of the data nugget creation, but you can still put your data set up somewhere public. Yeah, and we, we have really exciting plans for for making a forum where teachers can share great activities that they've made with data sets. Uh, as of now, they can make a data set and they can share it with people, um, but we will we will soon have sort of a public forum where, where people can contribute 